Hello, my name is Emily Vito, and I am the Assistant Director of Development at Film at Lincoln Center. Along with Amazon Studios, we are thrilled to present a conversation about the film Sound of Metal, featuring the cast and filmmakers, and moderated by Alison O'Daniel, a hard of hearing visual artist and filmmaker who is currently in production on her feature film, The Tuba Thieves, which is supported by Ford Foundation Just Films, Sundance, Field of Vision, SF Film, and Creative Capital. Before we get started, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our friends at Amazon for making this conversation possible. I'd also like to thank everyone viewing this presentation for being a member of Film at Lincoln Center and to welcome our guests joining us from Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. We're looking forward to sharing lots of films and programming with you in 2021, including the New York African Film Festival happening through February 14th, a new restoration of Olivier Assayas's Demon Lover opening on February 12th, and Rendezvous with French Cinema opening on March 4th. Please stay tuned to your email and visit our website for more details about becoming a member to save on screenings and support independent film. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Allison. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm gonna introduce you first. So we'll start off with the director of Sound of Metal, Darius Martyr. Um, hey, sorry, how are you, Allison? Rushed over your name, Darius Martyr. Um, and then the actors, we have Riz Ahmed. Nice to see you all. Um, we have Paul Rachi. Am I saying your last name correctly? Racy. Thank you. Racy. Paul Racy. We have um, Chelsea Lee and Olivia Cook. Hi there. And Domenico Toledo. And yeah, hi. Jeremy, Jeremy Lee Stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so noisy. God. Okay, so my first question um, is specifically for Jeremy. And I am wondering when you and Riz started this whole process and Darius was directing you, what was the most important thing that you wanted Riz to understand about the deaf experience? Yeah, sure, really the priority for for Riz to dive into the deaf community um, was paramount. So it was important for me to invite him to deaf community events. I invited Riz to my wedding and there were a lot of opportunities to practice using books and other means. This would ensure that Riz would be able to really acquire the identity of a deaf person it's very intense, the process. I think we, we went through this for about seven months at five days a week. Amazing. Okay, so um, my second question is for you, Darius. Um, can you tell us about Dorothy Martyr, who the film is dedicated to at the very end? Um, it says for Dorothy Martyr. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about her? And also, I'd actually love to know about both um, your, since your brother wasn't able to join us, I'd also love to know if you can kind of speak for both of you a little bit here. Not that that's totally fair, but you know. No, it's fair, come on. <laughs> he, he didn't show, so he he relinquished his right. No, I, I um, it's really nice. First of all, I'm excited about your film, Allison. That's exciting. Oh, um, it, it's, it's really nice to, um, to be asked about Dorothy uh, particularly in in lieu of the of the fact that we're at Lincoln Center, uh, at least virtually, because this was her stomp. Um, you know, she she lived on the Upper West Side, uh, not far from here, and uh, she was a gay activist, photographer, uh, an incredible cinephile, and she was late deafened, and she she was. Um, she was very troubled. She had a hard life. She was an orphan and she, she really battled her sexual identity, uh, her identity as a Jewish woman. Uh, she, had, she battled identity in myriad ways. And when she went deaf, she found a whole new battle. She, she found herself in between hearing and deaf culture. Uh, she was already in between so many cultures. She already had such a fraught sense of identity and she was brilliant. So she, 
she kind of, she really fell apart in ways. It was so hard for her and she fell into uh, alcoholism and other things. And she did a lot of amazing things at the same time, but it was such a struggle for her. And she fought, you know, losing that hearing, losing her connection to hearing culture was so hard. She fought for the rest of her life for films to be open captioned because she lost film completely. And so, you know, it was, it dawned on Abraham and I, when we were writing this, not only actually before the captioning even came up, it was really interesting how she found her way into the script. And she really did. We her the sense of her as a lost soul and an orphan really it connected with Ruben actually. And, and my, and, and that's a fascinating thing. You wouldn't think it, but, um, and her sense of kind of counterculture. And yeah, and then it, and then it became clear to Abraham and I that we absolutely must uh, dedicate this film to Dorothy and um, make sure that this film is open captioned uh, and, and, you know, kind of try to help with the fight of open captioning that so many people have been championing for years. Great, thank you. Um, my next question is about this thing that um, you talked with me about when we talked before, Darius, about this, instead of talking about um, this film being from a point of view or any particular point of view, you, you use this term point of hearing. And I love this term. And I think I even mentioned, I was like super jealous that I hadn't thought of this first. It's like, it's so brilliant and it's so important. And I'm really curious what, um, what this means to, to you, Darius, but also to you, Riz, um, and to Chelsea and Domenico. Um, I'm curious about what your relationship as deaf performers is to this idea of point of hearing. Do you guys want to go first or do you want me to? Do you want me to start that? I'm, I'm excited to hear what you guys think. <laughs> I'm happy for you to go, Darius, or well, Chelsea or Dominico. Go ahead, Darius. I'll just go, I'll say, in a, you know, the point of hearing aspect of this film is probably the oldest component of it. It was something that dawned on me 12 years ago when I was cutting footage of a band called Jucifer. It's a loud noise band. and. And that lit kind of lit me up, not because of its technical challenge, but really because it felt like a way into an, a, a language of empathy. And it felt like, like Roger Ebert called film empathy machines. I felt like that would be an empathy machine. If you could create that sense of vibration and connection to a character vis-a-vis -vis that kind of uh, perspective that I hadn't seen before. I've only seen in tiny little moments in movies. I've only heard in tiny little moments in movies. If you could actually really um, put yourself to that language of perspective and POH, as you say, uh, that that could just be mind blowing. And so that kind of, in a way that was this true North potential that really kept me going all those years when you know the universe wouldn't let me make this movie. <laughs> Um, and then Riz, what about what about you as you were, you know, developing your character? Maybe you weren't using that same term, but can you think back about your development of, of Ruben and how, and Paul, maybe you as well, I think, um, you know, how did you access this idea of like your point of view being a point of hearing, even as you're portraying yourself having lost your hearing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, when we were shooting, obviously, <clears throat> Ruben starts going through this, this process of hearing loss. When we were shooting, we decided to um, use audio blockers for me on set. So we took hearing aids that were switched onto a white noise setting and placed deep in my ear canal. And, but that was only done in certain sections of the film where Ruben uh, thinks of, hear, of, of his hearing loss as, as a loss of himself, as something that cuts him off from the world. For those sections of the film where um, he realizes that actually his growing deafness is actually an opportunity to connect more with other people than he ever has before and more with himself than he ever has before. We didn't use those audio blockers. So that point of hearing was tied in through, to an emotional point of view as well um, in terms of when I was, um, you know, uh, on, on set. In terms of 
you know, how the sound design finally ended up in the film is fascinating just to see that process with Nicola Becker, a sound designer, was on set, which is really rare, and recording everything from my blinking to swallowing to licking my lips to, you know, sound of the inside of my, my mouth. Um, and using that to build this perspective so you really feel like you're inside Ruben's head. Um, as Darius said, you're, you're in the cockpit of that kind of empathy machine. So, um, so, so both those aspects were, were things that were obviously, you know, I'd never experienced anything like that before in a, in a film. As far as uh, uh, my experience, I think I'm, I'm just very blessed uh, to have grown up with two parents that were, they were both deaf, however, they were different uh, stages of deafness. My father never heard anything uh, in his life. He, he was deaf at the age of six months, seven months. My mother was late in deaf about the age of five. So growing up with the both of them, I think it gave me as a child of deaf adults a certain empathy for especially what my mother went through. Uh, and so point of hearing for me is just hearing privilege. You know, uh, somebody who has heard and then loses it um, there was something about the set there in Boston that was very uh, uh, settling for me. It was, it was a, a peaceful atmosphere on that set. So uh, I had a, it was good for your awareness. I think Riz would also agree with that. The awareness, your senses seemed to be um, tightened on that farm setting we had there. Hmm. I mean, I love that you bring up this term hearing privilege because it's funny since Sound of Metal came out, many, many people have texted me and been like, have you seen this film? And then usually, um, and these are hearing people usually and they're like, the sound design's amazing. And I'm just like, I'm sure it is, but <laughs> I can't hear it. <laughs> like, so I love conceptually knowing that, you know, the inside of your mouth, Riz, was recorded your eyelashes as you're blinking. Like that blows my mind conceptually, but like, Chelsea and Domenico, I'm curious about like your relationship to this idea of a point of hearing. Um, do you have anything you wanna sort of, and also you don't have to, no pressure if it means nothing or is uninteresting, that's interesting to me, so. Sure, I'd be happy to chime in as well. Uh, I can appreciate how the, the concept of point of hearing and how that would apply to me as a deaf person. I think it's point of feeling for me, uh, that's the way that I would see it. Here's to that. <laughs> if you're watching the film, you really can feel it. You become a part of that moment with that character going through the loss that he's experiencing, what Ruben is encountering in his journey. It really is an empathy machine. You're actually diving right in and feeling that loss with him. And I think people really can be affected by that. So I love the idea of point of feeling. Um, yeah, and for me, Domenico, um, I feel like um, just, you know, with the movie, there's a scene with Ruben, um, you know, uh, what we're able to experience, what, what we went through during the film. Um, as, as people watch it and, you know, kind of see the process that Ruben goes through, um, I think the videography also shows that, you know, Ruben's in this place of feeling stuck by himself and facing all of his problems. But, you know, when people watch it from a deaf perspective, I think that it's important to understand that point of hearing, point of feeling as well. Yeah. That's fascinating. And I, I love this idea of point of feeling. And I think mm, um, me too. <laughs> I think it's all really important, you know, that we don't just privilege only the visual, but see all these like different sensory ways of experiencing a film. And that's like so lovely. That this that, that's 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 one thing that I just wanted to kind of add is it was interesting for me as a as a as a hearing person watching this film, for sometimes the the point of hearing in this film to actually be closer to a deaf perspective in some ways in that, um, for example, where you have people signing and that's not uh, captioned for, for, for people who don't sign, for example. So it's interesting that that kind of point of hearing isn't necessarily just the point of view of hearing people, but also tries to kind of skate closer to, as Ruben's character does, uh, a perspective that is closer to, 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 to that deaf experience as well. I, I love that you say that too, because 
And it's such a great question, Allison, and nobody's asked that in, in, the, in the way that you have, which is to really understand that from different perspectives. And when we were um, editing the film, you know, we, would, we, we often would look at cuts with no sound. We would turn the sound off and just watch the cut with captions because that we always felt like if this film doesn't play just captioned, then we're doing something wrong, you know? And so that was kind of a bar for us while we were cutting the movie is understanding that, you know, cause like you, you brought up my grandmother as the first thing to talk about. Well, she was in my heart the whole time I was making the movie and the whole time I was cutting the movie, I was thinking, what would she think? You know, which was scary cause she, she was very critical, but, um, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was thinking about her watching this movie and not being able to hear it. And so, you know, both, and Mickle was really interested. My editor was really interested in that. So we did a lot of that and, and, and it always was meant that point of hearing, I really don't think is, is just for hearing people. I, that, you know, I think that that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip one of my questions here. Um, and go back to it, but I want to get to you, Olivia, too, because um, I think that this film and Darius, you've talked about this um, when we when we spoke um, about how this film is so much about um, spirituality and finding one's identity. Obviously, the finding uh, Ruben's identity, but like underneath it, there's all these really beautiful aspects of spirituality, even in the cinematography, the relationship to nature in that space. Um, and in this film, I really got the feeling that Chelsea's character is like the most at ease, the most comfortable with who she is. Um, she just moves through that film fully in her body and as herself. Um, and we're really aware of Joe's journey too, because there's this backstory that we get access to. And so we know the conflict there. And then we see Lou's transformation um, at the end, but she doesn't seem quite aware of it, or at least she's resisting it. And Ruben actually sees that before she's able to. So I wanted to talk about this film as a spiritual film. And um, do any of the rest of you want to talk about how that informed how you approached your role, knowing that there is this, like each of you has this kind of like deep, except for maybe Chelsea, who's like pretty zen, but like <laughs> um, that each of you kind of has this thing you're searching for, or you're in this process of transformation. And Chelsea, I'm sure you are as well. I don't mean to not count you in this conversation, but um, so to clarify my question is about what did your sort of spiritual journey as a character, how did that inform the decisions you were making and what was um, what your impulses were in each of the scenes or just throughout the whole kind of arc of the film? It's no small question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey, did you? I could speak to that. I think uh, we had a lot of discussions with Darius before the filming about Jen's character. And I would agree that it has to be a person who has a very strong comfort level with their identity as a deaf person. I can certainly identify with that personally. I do feel very comfortable uh, as someone coming from a deaf family, an American Sign Language user. I'm proud of my deaf identity. And we look at the deaf community and how many different types of identities deaf people may have. And Jen is just one type of person within that huge gamut of our community. And Ruben represents one uh, nook of that community as does Paul. Uh, so it's really just one segment of our larger deaf world. And I think that we all have different ways of expressing those identities and that came through in the film. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if I should go ahead. Um, so uh, my character, um, you know, my identity, I, I play one of the kids in the film and, um, you know, there's like um, a scene where uh, Ruben and my character are kind of banging on the slide and letting the reverberations carry up and down to each other. And, um, you know, I, I feel like 
um, you know, with my identity, um, it, you know, in the film, I'm completely deaf and Ruben uh, is not um, at that point. Uh, and so there's kind of that interplay between our characters of kind of learning to feel and fall into the, the role um, and, and the, the new identity that Ruben is carrying. So it's, it's an interesting perspective. And, and also, if I can jump in there, Domenico, um, your character, Michael, uh, has always dealt with ADHD um, as a character. And that was very specific, right? Right, the, yeah. The writing of that character and very specific to why you bonded with Ruben. Because Ruben's always dealt with that same ADHD. And like you guys both can't sit still and watch that performance. Uh, and so in a way you're bonding even through a sub identity, even a, an identity that's, that's um, not deafness and not even related to deafness, but related to another thing that you share. And, you know, cause we had other scenes, Allison, in the film actually with Domenico, remember? And, you know, Domenico, you had a, a, a father who didn't ever learn sign language, remember in the movie? And so you you were even lacking that connection with your right. own father. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do remember. And it's also interesting uh, in the with Chelsea with your character because there's a lot that we shot with your character that unfortunately isn't in the film also. And I think that your character was much more fragile than it might appear. Um, you know, you were dealing, but I see it even when Ruben asks you who the woman is that you're drawing in the tattoo. Ruben says, who is that? And you go, nah, I'm not telling you. You know, and it's representative of just that bit of protection uh, that tells you, at least when I see it, it gives me a window into a whole world. And Olivia and Riz, I, I'm curious about, um, about your sort of Spirit, your spiritual interpretations of, of these characters, like their kind of spiritual journey. And um, Olivia, with your character, with Lou, we we don't see, you know, we, we really don't see what she goes through once they separate. We have that one little moment where um, Ruben sees Lou performing on her own and feels um, a lot of conflict about that. And then you know, once we meet her, she's gone through this completely unseen transformation. And so how did you process that? What was, um, what was your kind of approach to this character? I'm really bad at like intellectualizing any of it or having really like a, a set process that I can really speak to. But I think what was amazing about this experience and the, the atmosphere that Darius created for us all is that we shot it chronologically. So the 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 first part of the film, Riz and I were were really in it, and we'd had two months, a month and a half together of um, rehearsals with our band, and and then we're in this airstream, living this life together. And then when I said goodbye and get in the taxi, that's when I got on a plane as Olivia and and was away for a month, and we were only connected again when we were in Antwerp. So so much had changed they'd all had an, another experience that I wasn't a part of and me too and it, it was a, di a different atmosphere you had this really um really just intense um really cathartic time together and then be, like movie sets are like film sets are that's so you become such fast friends and then you all move on again and so trying to get that back in the in the time that we shot the last bit of the, the film in the seven days is, is really tough and that's not anyone's fault. So, but it was really um, palpable and, and electric and it worked so well for the film. Um, and so it was, it was kind of just opening yourself up for me and allowing that to dictate performance. And Riz, for you, I think, you know, we get this like tiny, tiny moment in the film um, at the very, is it a, I don't, I was about to say at the very end, but am I not supposed to say Oh, that's it? right. Oh, no. That's okay. <laughs> I'll just say, you know, we do see some peace in your eyes, like at the very, very end. And it's a little inconclusive, but I think there is just this moment of finally, like a little bit of a, a sigh of relief of, 
and what what that means i think is open to interpretation um it does feel so markedly different from everything that's playing on your face throughout the whole rest of the film and so i'm curious just about like that emotional journey that spiritual journey can you can you speak to that yeah i think this is an incredibly spiritual film and that was clear on the script um it was clear even when i met darius um you know that that's he wanted to explore those ideas um i mean in a way i kind of feel like there is only one spiritual journey you know for all of us and it's about kind of letting go you know letting go of your idea of who you think you are and in the process finding yourself once you let go of your idea of how things should be or who you should be you kind of get to find out who you are and what really is and i think that's the universal spiritual journey and i think that that's ruben's journey um and i hope it's also a journey for audiences who see the film you know once you let go of this concept of yourself and you actually get to grips with who who you truly are that core of humanity you realize that core of humanity is the same for all of us so for ruben he realizes there's no us and them there's no hearing and deaf there's there's you know there's just us there's no us and them you know and i hope the audiences who see this film as well kind of walk away with that spiritual lesson really that there's no us and them there's just us you know um once you let go of these ideas um of who you are or who other people are yeah we're all exposed warts and all and that's the great unifier especially in this film and I have to say, Alison, on the spirituality part of it, uh, when I uh, first read the script, you know, I, uh, the thing that struck me most of all was the spiritual aspect. Most of, over everything else, growing up as a Roman Catholic in Chicago, I used to do the, ma uh, the, the mass in Latin at that time, uh, praying to a God that was out there to bring, please God, to placate God, to bring something down here on earth to me. And as my spiritual journey grew here in Los Angeles, I ran into uh, principles that taught me exactly what Darius and his brother had written on the page I, when Joe has that final conversation with Reuben about the kingdom of God being right here. That's the thing that really struck me above anything else in the script, because that is what I believe. So as I was saying before, to be on that farm where we filmed it, uh, the consciousness and the awareness was just growing for me uh, more and more every day. That, and uh, so when we got to that final scene with uh, with Riz and myself, I th it, for me it felt so real because was, I was talking about something that's very very tangible in my life. God, the kingdom of God is right here. That's that's the big spiritual lesson I think for everybody. Uh, there's no separation. In other words, you're not separate from God. None of us. And uh, if you could just glean that out of there, I think um, it brings a, it brings a, uh, a stillness, if you will, only for well, a, a fleeting second. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that scene in particular is just, it's so beautiful. And, um, you know, once Ruben walks out the door, Paul, like the, the sort of that last breath you take is so tangible and, mm -hmm. um, and heavy, it's full of it's full of a lot, and it's really beautiful and sad and many things. Um, and so, actually, I have one last question, and it's I'll bring us completely back down to earth, and it's about responsibility. And um, I'm really curious um, for the deaf participants um, in this film. You know, when when you are a, a public face in the deaf community, do you feel a, a sort of responsibility to present you know basically what joe is trying to teach ruben is this this sense that him having chosen this decision which for some people across the you know entire deaf spectrum is a really really valid choice but in this environment um riz choosing to do this or sorry ruben choosing to do this is um joe's worried about what that's going to teach all of the deaf people who are there. And so I'm curious, you know, outside of the film, for um, those of you in the deaf community as now public faces in the deaf community, do you feel a responsibility to put kind of a certain really healthy face forward 
for the larger deaf community. Jeremy. This is Jeremy, I'll speak to that. Yeah. So I really would like to um, to call this out. And yes, this is our responsibility. And so me calling out Ruben's journey as an individualistic journey, you know, is important. Um, what he has gone through, the things that he had experienced were unique to his journey, arriving to the end, getting that cochlear implant. Yes, while it's true that some deaf people would like cochlear implants, it's up to them and it's their decision. Um, so getting that cochlear implant, that doesn't eliminate the deafness, you know, and so just being open to picking up ASL and open to the community really allows for the deaf community to be accepting of those people. A lot of people have reached out to me and have said, what's up with that? Why did Joe displace Ruben? Why didn't he accept Ruben's decision to get a colloquialium implant? I really want to clarify that Ruben had violated several tenants of the program. He, he left, he used email or phones. He broke a lot of the tenants. It wasn't because he got the cochlear implant. It was because he violated the rules of the house. That really just set Joe off. I think, you know, he, he had given him so many opportunities. There were so many rules there in the deaf community in this movie including that role. Um, and then that person coming into the community and violating all those principles led to this uh, result. So I just wanted to clarify on that. He's also jumping on here and saying, yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, the cochlear implant wasn't a fix. And so once he went through with that process, it wasn't right or wrong. You know, it was his decision and we can accept that we can move forward with that. We weren't, you know, he wasn't being um, ostracized from the community. It was just that, you know, it was his decision because of his hearing loss. And then really at the end, we see how he feels about that and why he decides to take the cochlear off. So, and in, in general, the deaf community doesn't ostracize people because they go ahead with implants. That isn't something that they decide to do. Exactly. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Dominico speaking. I just wanted to add as well that, you know, really whether you're deaf, hard of hearing, you get the the uh, implants or not, whatever the identity that you choose is, it is ultimately up to you. As Chelsea said, the deaf community doesn't discount others or ostracize them. Um, everybody's identity is going to be, you know, individualized. Um, okay, well, thank you all so much. And um, I really appreciate this conversation and for you willing to be uh, intellectual about hearing. <laughs> and um, thank you for making such a beautiful <laughs> film and this collective, um, collective sort of uh, effort and really pays off. It's really beautiful. So. Thanks so much, Allison. It was amazing. Thank you. Amazing to talk. Thank you. And I want to see you soon, Domenico. I got to see you soon. It's been too long. Yes, yes, of course, of course. No, me too. I want to see you as well. And thanks for having a Sound of Metal poster in your background. <laughs> <laughs> I could have get one of those oh, yeah. posters, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is behind me. I forgot about that. <laughs> bye, guys. Thank you. Much love, everyone. Take care. I love you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Cheers to everybody. <laughs>